and our keynote speaker and executive director for the Napa County Historical Society is Dr. Shelley O. Smith. Um, as many of you know, Shelley was born here in Napa. Uh, she went to Jess and Sienna. Um, she studied anthropology um, at the University of Arizona and eventually special time in maritime archaeology. And we're going to receive the benefits of, of some of her research and uh, her adventures um, during her career. Uh, later, she went to Texas A&M and she got her master's degree um, and, um, and then her doctorate at University of Pennsylvania. Um, Shelly has broad, vast um, professional experience um, and she also um, joined what's called the PASS Foundation, and she was very fundamental with the PASS Foundation, um, which was a nonprofit that started as a wee little nonprofit and became this really special educational gift um, uh, to, that, to, to the folks that um, participate in that. Um, Shelly is still very active in other endeavors, um, including the um, education, passion for education, the arts, um, anthropology, including California State Parks, Diving Advisory, Ohio, Ohio's Shadowbox Live Education Advisory, and International Advisory of Council of Underwater Archaeology. Uh, this evening, um, the topic tonight is repurposing and reusing California ships. So Shelley, if you'd like to take it away, um, uh, we look forward to roughly maybe a 40 minute presentation and then we'll have probably 10 minutes for a Q&A and final question and then maybe um, I'll, I'll have a couple words to share of what's coming ahead. Great. Thanks, Liz. Thanks for that killer introduction. <laughs> I'm going to share with you guys my uh, slideshow tonight. Um, and uh, here we go. Can you all see this? Is that whoops, where somehow I'm okay, anyway. Okay. I see, I can see my, can you all see my screen? Is that good? Please say yes. Um, so uh, as Liz pointed out, I was born in Napa and raised here. I learned to sail on the Napa River and for reasons that are probably will always elude me, I had a grand passion for ships um, from the time I was a little kid. Uh, and so I, I wanna start, I was asked a few months ago by uh, Dr. Manichetti at, um, at uh, San Jose State to write a chapter in his new book on maritime communities of California. And this is one of the topics that percolated to the top of my interest level and, my, and what I wanted to write about. And so I thought uh, I amassed all these pictures because of course my museum background, I wanted lots of pictures and the, the chapter could have, I think four pictures. And so I had to like, and I thought, well, this would be a great time to then share pictures with you. So when I start off tonight, I want to do um, start off by saying that ships in their simplest form are just vessels. Um, they hold things. And at the peak of their careers, they're watertight or kind of close to watertight. And um, <laughs> they're like your Tupperware, like their smaller cousins, your Tupperware, they hold lots of things. They can hold multiple things over time. They can hold different things on different cruises or many, many things, same, same things. Um, and so there comes a time in lots of cultures around the world where um, ships got their use. People said, aha, I can use this ship differently than it was purposed for. And especially in maritime communities, you see this again and again through time. And uh, so you can see it through, through all through history. So during the period on your upper right-hand screen, you can see um, these are the ships at Ostia. This was in the Emperor Claudius at about 45 um, CE, which is current era. He um, took all of his old big wooden ships. He needed a port that was a deep water port for the burgeoning city of Rome. And he, um, he took all these big ships out to the, to the harbor at Ostia, which is right at the mouth of the Tiber River. And he filled them with concrete and he made big, huge keys that went out into deep water so big ships could come in and, and get rid of their grain and whatever they were carrying. In about the 1700s, um, when Manhattan was really growing as a city, so if you look down to your, or over to your left, um, you can see that Manhattan was growing. Manhattan was, had tidal flats all around it. It couldn't get big ships into to let off its cargo. So what they did is they built piers out 
And at the end of the piers, they literally nailed big ships in place and used those as the end of a pier as a staging area so big ships could pull alongside and offload their things. What you have down here in this screen, this is what was originally thought to be what we called the Ronson ship. Um, Manhattan is three blocks wider all the way around today. And there are a number of ships at this, li at this line, this block line that go around that ring the city. One was found recently when they, after they were cleared the rubble for the uh, World Trade Center. Um, this was called the Ronson ship, but later through research found out to be the uh, Princess Carolina. And uh, so the Princess Carolina was a tobacco carrier. She was an armed tobacco carrier that carried um, tobacco back and forth between the colonies in England. In about a few 30 years later or so, um, the British had a problem. They had way too many people in their prisons. They didn't want to build new prisons. Uh, they had a poverty problem in the, in the 1780s under King George. And so they came up with this really brilliant idea. They decided to ship all of their convicts off to their newly discovered continent of Australia. And so what you can see here are pictures of con in the dead center. Are those are convict ships all pulled up alongside in Sydney Harbor and they were used to house and jail the convicts. So this is once again, a reuse of, of, of this different kinds of things. And then down far in the right hand corner, this in the Falkland Islands in the 1850s, when um, people were trying to get to the gold rush, California gold rush, trying to get to Australia, they would come around Cape Horn, South America. And if they got in trouble, they would have to, they would have to beat their way back up. And the closest port for them to beat their way to was Stanley Harbor in the Falkland Islands. This is the wreck, or the hulk rather, of the, um, of the Charles Cooper. It's sitting in, in Stanley Harbor. And you can see that it's got a building built over it because the Falklands don't have a lot of trees. <laughs> and so they could use, easily use these ships as storehouses um, that they could then put their supplies in for transshipping. And you can see this has happened through time, lots and lots of things. But if we really focus just on California, we can see that um, in California, we were able in Yerba Buena was really, which was the sleepy little port, which later became the bustling urban place called San Francisco. It had a cove that was a tidal cove. And in the tidal cove of um, in here, these were all mud flats. And it was really hard to get cargo in from the ships. So they would have to use these little teeny ships back and forth. So it was really not suited very well for urbanization at the time by in 1847. And in 1847, the population of Yer Yerba Buena was around 2,000 people in about February 1849. 18 months later, in, 18, in July of 1850, there were 40,000 people living here. So you can see the pressure in this city to expand and to be able to become a deep water port. And it was really, it was really important for it to become a deep water port. So you can see here, this is what it looked like. <laughs> one year later. That's mass. That's a sea of mass of ships um, out there. And in, in 1847, um, they already decided that they really, really needed to, to fill in this cove. Um, and they, so the interim US military governor, Stephen Kearney, gave permission to Alcalde or the mayor of, of San Francisco, a man named Edwin Bryant. And he then uh, surveyed the cove, the shallow cove, and he, um, he then had an auction in July of 1847, and he auctioned off 444 water lots. Now you can already in the top left-hand picture see a, a vessel that's already got a, a already um, housed over. Uh, it's a store ship, store ships in the bustling, um, San Francisco in the 1849, 1848. Uh, they, there was no place to put your cargo. It was either going to lay out on the streets in the mud or something. So store ships provided restaurants, housing, places for business to have things, all kinds of stuff for it. And so these lots, and you can see one fenced in out there, the lots were 137 feet long and about 46 feet wide. Now, interestingly enough, the most common size of vessel 
who that came into San Francisco port was a brig, a bark, or, or a ship rig vessel of about 300 tons, between 300 and 400 tons. And the size of a 300 to 400 ton vessel was about 137 feet long and about 45 feet long. And the reason that this is really important is because part of the thing that you had to do if you bought one of these water lots was improve it. And improving it meant you could sink a ship on it and that improved it immediately. And so they uh, really began this interesting, interesting um, piece of, of kind of, a, of work that, uh, that spawned work in, the, in, the, in San Francisco because in these pictures that you see in 1850, in June of 1850, there were 509 ships in the harbor. And of those nine, of those 509 ships, 148 of them were store ships. And so these store ships, these hulks were, were readily available. People could buy them um, and they could be sunk. And so this began a whole new career for a number of ship captains. Probably the most famous was a man named Captain Fred Lawson. He became a hulk undertaker as he was called. And he sunk many a ship on, um, in, in the harbor there to improve the lots. Uh, and so we're into one of the very first vessels that came in and, um, and they used to really improve the lot was um, the Niantic. The Niantic was a whaling ship. It was in Peru when uh, they announced the discovery of gold. Captain Cleveland, uh, the, of the head of the captain of the ship, he brought it to Panama, re-outfitted it with bunk beds, and he brought on mules and all kinds of mining gear and sailed for San Francisco. He cleared the gate in, 20, in uh, July, rather, 5th, 1849. And uh, within 24 hours, the, every passenger was gone and every one of his crew had deserted and he couldn't even get his cargo off his ship. So he, he asked the military to help him. They found some of the deserters, at least enough of them that he was able to sell and get all his cargo off his ship. And then he asked the factor who represented the company, the Rhode Island company that owned the ship if he couldn't sell the ship. And so by August of 1849, he'd sold the Niantic and he and Fred Lawson they took all the ballast, all the rock and everything out of the ship to lighten it up, to make it float higher in the water. And then they put the big, huge tripod cauldrons, which were used to, to um, render blubber on, on whaling ships. They, they strapped, they lashed those to the side of the ship and they floated it even higher and they pushed it up into the cove as far as it would go. And what you see here in this color picture, that is the bow of the Niantic. At first, they had to have a little pier that went out to it um, and so you could get into it. But as they filled in around it, you can see they just cut a door right in the front of the hull and it became a hotel. It was called the Hotel Niantic. And it was, it was a hotel that served the people until um, 1851. It was a very popular hotel. It burned in the conflagration of 1851, but was rebuilt using what was left of the hall as the foundation and the second Niantic Hotel stood at its location until 1872. Lots of ships happened. The conflagration of 1851 burned lots and lots of ships that were, that were store ships or, or, and being used uh, along those. And they were buried. What they did is they pushed all the rubble from the fire into the cove and buried, basically buried the cove. And so what you see in the top left-hand picture here are ships that have been identified that are underground in San Francisco today. And so we know about these through archeology. span So I brought back the little picture that we showed before of the water lot. And I drew a circle around a little scow schooner down there sitting tied up to one of the, one of the lot railings. And it happens to be the hair lighter that you see in the middle archeological picture that excavated in C2. The one to the far right is the, is the General Harrison. It was also excavated in San Francisco. And you can see that a buildings, the buildings are built right over it as this hall goes straight into the wall of a building. 
So by 1851, store ships were no longer needed in San Francisco. Um, they had enough they had enough lumber, they really were pretty well off and they could build houses and things like that. And so they didn't. But if we go 100 miles up river in the Sacramento River to Sutter's Landing or John Sutter's Fort, um, it's a similar story with, a, with kind of different, different pressures on, on, the, on the people. Um, so before hydraulic mining happened, uh, which was between, we started about 1851, um, big ships could sail right up the Sacramento River. The Sacramento River was about 25 feet, 25 to 30 feet deep in most places. And so big ships could sail right up. And so a number of them did. And then some of them were just left and they were used immediately, almost immediately as store ships for the burgeoning little town of Sacramento. Uh, and the, one of the problems of Sacramento had, unlike, unlike San Francisco, it wasn't that it the, the boats couldn't almost sail right up to the edge of the, of the river. It was that every winter the river flooded and Sacramento was under two to three feet of water. In fact, in, in one of the early floods in Sacramento of 1850, 51, um, there are stories of people sailing on boats from Sacramento to Vacaville because the flooded waters had spread so far. They just sailed all the way across. Um, so there, that was a really big problem. You couldn't leave your cargo. You couldn't live in a tent that was flooded, that was in two or three feet of water every winter. So store ships became a really important part of the Embarcadero of Sacramento. And it stayed much longer than in San Francisco when they didn't burn down, but also they, they just were very, very useful. So the globe, the orb, the diamond, the ninus, the Sterling and the Crescent all became store ships along the Embarcadero. In fact, at almost the, every terminus of the alphabet streets in Sacramento, there was a store ship. And these store ships were providing places to put cargo, places to live, places to have businesses, etc. And it worked out very, very well for Sacramento uh, until about 1870, when finally Sacramentans just were like, we've had enough. Off with the off with the store ships, but you can see in this early in this early lithograph of Sacramento that there are store ships all around. One of the one of the ships, the Lagrange, was brought out and put midstream. Um, it this is a kind of a fanciful up in the right hand side is a fanciful drawing of what um, the store what it looked like. Um, this was drawn by a man who was told about Lagrange being a jail for Sacramento, but never really saw it. It didn't really have this high of a of a big huge structure on top, but it did. It was um, housed over, and it was the jail for Sacramento until 1859. In 1859, during the flood of 1859, while it was out midstream, uh, the rivers rose so fast that they pulled the bow down and they flooded the hull of the ship, and uh, in and then the silt coming down the river filled it in, and they were not able to save the ship, but they were able to save the jail, the jail um, cell doors. And so those red doors down at the bottom were taken off the Lagrange and they were sold to the city of Elk Grove just down river. And they became the jail doors for Elk Grove and are still there today. So things keep getting reused and repurposed. As sailing ships by about 1870, 1880, most of the ships that had been part of the gold rush were gone. They'd either left port and resailed out to some other place or in some graveyard someplace, some ship graveyard. And you have to know that there, was, there were ship graveyards in San Francisco. They were at Hunter's Point off of Candlestick. There was a ship graveyard there over in Oakland, Alameda Creek. All these places were ship graveyards. Uh, Glen Cove, which is right to the east of uh, the Carquinas Bridge was a, was a graveyard, ship graveyard. And there was one in Sausalito too. Uh, so as those ships disappeared, taking their place were paddle wheelers. Paddle wheelers had two advantages to them. They didn't have as big a draft, so they could go up now the, the much shallower Sacramento River because um, mining had really filled in the river. Um, and they were, they were uh, reliable. They could keep going even if there was no wind. So the steam, the paddle wheelers went up and down 
the Sacramento and across back and forth across the bay. Um, and so there were a lot of, of um, paddle wheelers. It was considered the most uh, reliable form of transportation prior to uh, really the railways taking over at the turn of the century. Um, but by 1920s, um, the paddle wheelers were pretty obsolete because the railroads had taken their place and cars were coming into vogue. And so lots of these paddle wheelers were laid up in Sacramento on the Sacramento River, but on the Yolo County side of the Sacramento River, there were I think over 30 of these, of these vessels laid up there. And then on, um, on August uh, 28th, 1932, uh, the fleet burned to the waterline. But prior to that, this had been the red light district for Sacramento. So it was quite a, quite a useful reuse of these vessels, uh, quite a popular place for people to go. <laughs> and the store ships, they were all gone by this time too. A lot of them just sunk in place on the Sacramento side of the river. And so it was through, once again, through archeology span that we were able to find some of these vessels. A lot of the vessels, the last of the sailing ships and the last of, of, of some of these paddle wheelers and everything, they actually got reused in, in the movies because the movies were taking on and there were things like Mutiny on the Bounty, The Wake of the Red Witch and all these great shows, um, great movies with um, Clark Gable and, uh, and John Wayne and things like that. And so they actually bought old hulks and they just sailed them around, took pictures of them. Um, they were cheap, they, um, so they could sink them. It was, so it made it really realistic to see, uh, you know, one of these ships sink out in the middle of the, between uh, Catalina and uh, LA. And so it was, it was quite, they were quite wonderful. And so the two on the left here are two of the vessels that were in the movies, um, in some of the movies that we've, we've seen. At about the same time, uh, of course, really bright little entrepreneurs in Southern California, they kind of figured out a loophole in the law that gambling wasn't allowed on in California, but three miles off the coast was international waters. And thus, <laughs> they could, if they could had a boat, <laughs> if they had a boat, they could put a boat out there, anchor it out there and put uh, gambling casinos on these boats. And so this became known as the fleet of the rolling bones uh, in, in kind of reference to, to dice. And uh, it was, uh, there was a lot of association with the mob and Jack Dagna, famous mob boss in LA. Uh, so the Joanna Smith, the, Mont, uh, the Mon Falcone, the Tango, the, the SS Texas, the Rose Isle. These were all positioned off the beaches in Long Beach, um, San Diego and Santa Barbara. And they, they, were, they were very, very popular gambling casinos. Um, but the, of course, um, lots of people objected to gambling at the time. Uh, remember we had prohibition. <laughs> and uh, so there was, a, there, was some, there was a lot of pressure on then California Attorney General uh, Earl Warren. And he took action in 1830, I mean, in 1939, and he, um, he tried to uh, eliminate gambling vessels. He tried really hard. Uh, it took him about six months because at first the gambling vessels would just move up and down the coast. So he would go to raid one place and they wouldn't be there. They'd be someplace else and go back. And so it worked, went on and on. But finally, by about um, 1940, um, Earl Warren had successfully ended the gambling casinos, the floating gambling casinos in, in California. And in, in 1948, Truman, President Truman signed an act which prohibited um, gambling at sea. And eventually the international, uh, the international line for uh, water was, was moved out to six miles. So it, all of these things kind of helped um, take care of, of the problem that they were having with the gambling ships. But these were all reused ships. These ships had been either passenger ships or packet liners or whatever, they were all re just reused. Another thing that was really popular for reuse in California was to turn something into a restaurant. 
So the Charles Van Damme was a ferry boat, a very, very popular ferry boat on, on San Francisco Bay. Um, and in um, 1955, it was dragged up on shore in Sausalito and turned into a restaurant called The Ark. It was a very famous nightclub for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, <laughs> very popular place in Sausalito. Uh, in Southern California, they brought the, um, the packet uh, down from the Princess Louise had been what's called a pocket liner. She was, um, she, she traveled up and down between Canada and, um, and San Diego, make, bringing passengers um, throughout. She was built in 1921 and she um, had a really full career. Then in 1960, she was bought and turned into a restaurant in Los Angeles Harbor. And she was extremely popular. Many, many people were married there, um, divorced there, and you know, had all kinds of things going on there. Anyway, so she was a she was a popular restaurant for 20 years. But then in she as this kind of thing began to wane and she began to look a little more and more tired in 1989. She was um, the, the company that owned her uh, went bankrupt and she was towed across to San Pedro and put in a, in a, in a berth there. And then she mysteriously capsized at, while at dock. And so you can see that picture of her rolled over on her side. Um, and uh, Lloyd's of London who insured her said that it was sabotage and they refused to pay for it. So eight months later, she was, she was righted and she was towed out to sea the idea that she was going to be sunk in 400 feet and become a fish, a fish reef, which would encourage um, uh, recreational fishing off the coast of LA and help the fishing industry, the Long Beach um, sport diving, sport fishing industry. Um, she got the last laugh. The Princess Louise sank in 900 feet of water, and that was the end of of the Princess Louise's uh, uh, careers there. So then we, we also have more. We have, um, some of you might remember the Petaluma Queen. She was a popular uh, paddle wheeler that was um, stationed over in Petaluma and then um, moved over to Napa. She never really got, um, she never really got as famous in Napa, I guess, because she was named the Petaluma Queen. It was hard to make her a famous Napa boat. <laughs> but anyway, she um, eventually went down to San Diego and she became a restaurant in San Diego known as the Grand Romance. And she was, she was quite popular uh, until about 2017. At that time, her company went bankrupt and, she, and now there's talk of moving her back up to Northern California. Two other vessels, two other paddle wheelers that had long careers on the Sacramento River was the Delta King and the Delta Queen. Uh, they were sister ships. They, looked, they were identical really. Um, the Delta King is now a hotel um, birthed at the Embarcadero uh, in Sacramento, and you can go stay on it if you like. The Delta Queen was first uh, repurposed to work for the military during World War II, and then she was repurposed once again and sent to the Mississippi where the Delta Queen still is a um, casino gambling tourist attraction on, on the, um, on the the uh, on the Mississippi. We also have for some of you who've been in Southern California, um, the Reuben E. Lees. Um, this one is particularly interesting to me, uh, one, because I was the director of the museum there, but, but two, because when they were built, there were two Reuben E. Lees built, one's in San Diego and one's in, San Fr and one's in um, Newport uh, Beach. But when they were built, uh, the company that built them came up to Oakland and went out to Rotten Row, which is the graveyard there in Oakland, and um, took two paddle wheelers off of two authentic paddle wheel ships and took all kinds of interior pieces off of the ship. And so if you look at the, at the, at the picture down on your left hand side, you can see that um, these, they, the, there's little details and everything. They were able to hire elder carpenters who had worked on these on these river boats to come in and and recreate a very authentic look on both the uh, Reuben Ely's. In the 1990s, um, the Reuben Ely in, in, um, in, in Newport 
was renamed the Spirit of Newport, and it became it was it was uh, transformed into a museum, a maritime museum for Southern California. And it was extremely popular. Like the Princess Louise, many many people. While I was the director there, many people came to tell me that they had either proposed to their wives, married their wives, divorced their wives, found their mistresses or whatever on board the Reuben E. Lee. And it was considered an iconic landmark in Newport Beach. Uh, but it's interesting that it was built and created out of old ships. The uh, thing is, in finally, in, the in, 20, uh, in 2007, and so in 2007, the, the spirit of Newport the hull was was um, beginning to really corrode, and so it was um, dismantled. And the bottom part, the barge part of the hull, was taken out um, off the coast and sunk in deep water. A few years later, the uh, Reuben E. Lee in San Diego sank right at its birth, and they dismantled it at its birth. And so both are both of these vessels are now gone. The idea of reuse is not just for entrepreneurs. I mean, the Navy really did a great, had this all along in many, many ways. Um, they, the US Navy was consistent in their reuse. Um, and so for, for those of us who have grown up here, uh, know about Mare Island and uh, have ever been there, the, the Mare Island was the first Naval Yard built in California. And it was also the home uh, then of the USS Warren, the USS Independence, and um, the USS Savannah. All of these vessels, the USS Warren being the first, was the first prison ship in San Francisco. Um, later, the Euphemia, which is the center in there, uh, in the picture, the, the lithograph, the Euphemia was a, was a jail for San Francisco for a while. And in this picture that you're seeing here, this lithograph, you're looking at the back end of the Apollo, which was one of those ships that was pulled up and turned into, an, into apartments and hotels. Um, the Independence was used first as a prison ship and then as a store ship and then as a, a dormitory for young, um, for young sailors at, the, at Mare Island. And it was there until 1912. And there's a picture of it up on your upper left. One of the most iconic sites uh, for me growing up was the mothball fleet in Sassoon. And so there are only a very few of these mothball fleets all in the United States. This is one of them. At its height, it had um, over 340 ships in the mothball fleet. Uh, and this, it was huge. It was, it just, went on and on forever. And these were ships from World War II, the Korean War, and, um, and Vietnam War. Over time, of course, though, that they began to de deteriorate, you can see the picture down in the, in the bottom right, where you're starting to see the corrosion happen and everything. Environmental groups really began to become very, very worried about what it would do to Sassoon Bay. And so the MARAD, the naval um, group, they began to uh, disperse these they took them to wrecking yards all over the world and they were and they dismantled these ships and so today there are only 10 uh, vessels in the mothball fleet at Sassoon. But one of the cool things about the mothball fleet is that you think okay it was never re they were never reused again as anything but <laughs> as they were only naval ships but the money that came from their scrapping was given to the maritime museums in the United States to help preserve ships. And we'll see some of those in just a minute that got preserved because of it. The other idea that you can use a ship is it might not be immediately um, apparent of what you're gonna use a ship for, or reuse a ship for, but lots of them get repurposed many years later because we have a new thought. And I know that Denise Jaffke is in the audience tonight. And so um, Denise, has led the charge to create California's first maritime trail. It's really, really cool. And it's in um, Emerald Bay. Emerald Bay was the home of Emerald Bay Resort from the 1880s on. And as you can see in the picture, there was lots of little skiffs and rowboats and kayaks and canoes and all kinds of things for people who were vacationing at the resort to use to go out fishing and everything. 
In the 1950s, when the resort was given to state parks, they sank all of the boats, the little boats in place. And so those little boats are still sitting there and you can see one right there, it's with its bait box right in the middle. And it's now called the mini fleet and they have been mapped in place. And they are, because the water is so clear, it's really easy to snorkel around this, uh, this trail and you get to see all these little boats that were really popular at this resort in the, in the early part of the 1900s. Also across the bay in Emerald Bay, at the top of the bay really, is a home called Vikings Home. Many, maybe some of you have got, had the privilege of seeing it. It was built by Laura Knight and she was um, a wife of a very wealthy broker from the Midwest. She loved um, Scandinavian design. She hired a cousin of hers to design their, her summer home. And, and she brought out all kinds of um, craftsmen from Scandinavia to make it happen. Um, at the time the house was built, there was no road around uh, Lake Tahoe. And the only way you could get things up and down Lake Tahoe was to, to bring them by barge. And so there were two barges that were used to build Vikings Home. And when the Vikings Home was built, the barges were no longer needed. They were taken over to the um, one side of, the, of Emerald Bay and they were drilled, holes were drilled in them and they were sunk in place. Those barges are still there today and they form part of this maritime trail and they're really easy. You can see, I believe that might even be Denise, they're taking pictures of, of the barges uh, underwater. Another really famous and iconic vessel on Lake Tahoe was the SS Tahoe. It was built in San Francisco in pieces, shipped by railroad to Tahoe and re constructed or constructed at Glenbrook uh, on, on the Nevada side. Um, and then it was launched there and it served, um, it served the, the, the lake until um, 1940. And so from 1896 to 1940, it was the way you got around the ship. It could carry 200 passengers. It was 169 feet long and it was beautiful, a beautiful, beautiful boat. Uh, in 1940, there was no interest in the vessel any longer. There was a road around um, Tahoe, didn't need, the, didn't need the, the SS Tahoe any longer. And so they decided, the, um, the fathers, the political fathers of, of Glenbrook decided they would sink her uh, right outside Glenbrook and that she would then become a glass bottom boat attraction and people could drive over her and see her and how cool she was. But um, the SS Tahoe, she got the last laugh. Um, the sides of Lake Tahoe are very steep. And so when the boat sank, it just kept going. <laughs> Settled down in 440 feet of water. So the SS Tahoe is, is, is still approachable today, but not through a glass bottom boat. And so you, you don't get to see her any longer, but uh, we do get to see her every once in a while through remote sensing. The other thing, and we talked about this just a minute ago, is that some of these boats have been preserved. Not all of them got reused, but some of them have been reused to help us understand history better. And so they are in part of maritime museums with 1,100 miles of coastline, 29, I believe, underwater parks, and five national marine sanctuaries. California has one of the most rich uh, maritime heritage systems in, in, in the United States. Um, and we have several big, huge fleets of, of historic vessels that have been preserved and are open to tourism. One of the biggest fleets, of course, is in San Diego at the San Diego Maritime Museum, where they have the Star of India. They have um, the, the Berkeley, the, the Ferry Berkeley. They have two submarines. They have, um, they have one of the, uh, the replicas of, of, the, of Cabrillo's ship that went up and down the coast. Um, they have little pilot boats. They have the steam yacht Medea. And they also have um, the HMS Surprise, which was used in the movie with Russell Crowe, Master and Commander um, in the recent one, which interestingly enough, the Rose, the uh, HMS Surprise was originally built as a replica ship, the Rose for the War of 1812 and was uh, up in Canada until it was sold to the movie 
industry and made into the HMS surprise for Russell Crowe's movie. Moving up the coast, we have another iconic vessel. Um, Los Angeles Harbor was the first harbor in the nation to have a fire boat. Uh, and so you can see up there with, with all her cannons going, um, the fire boat, Ralph J. Scott, wrote the, and the crew that, that Vander wrote the book on, take, on, how, on how to handle fires in a harbor. And she is um, very, very well known um, within that milieu of firemen. Uh, and she is now up on the on land now and is uh, available to to look at and to and to go aboard. Right next door is the Angel Gate. This is a World War II tug that was um, part of Los Angeles and the Long Beach Naval Air, Naval Base. Um, the the Angel's Gate is now part of the Los Angeles Maritime Museum fleet uh, preserved fleet. Coming up further, we in Long Beach we have the Queen Mary. The Queen Mary is the the um, the famous cruise line, the luxury liner. She has one of the best preserved Art Deco bars in the world, and she is a hotel that you can easily go down and stay on. And if you haven't done it, I highly recommend it. Coming into San Francisco, we have the San Francisco Maritime Museum and their fleet, which was the Balclutha, uh, the Eric. The Eureka, which is the which is the uh, ferry boat, the C.A. Thayer, the submarine Pampanito, and the um, the scout schooner Alma. And the scout schooner Alma is dead center in the middle. This I wanted you to see because this was the workhorse of of the of all the traffic on San Francisco Bay and the and the other bays and up and down the river. This is what carried the into Napa. There's lots of scout schooners. One of my favorite in Napa because it was so ugly was called the Cinderella. And so it's one of my favorite little vessels uh, for this, uh, for the, this kind of things. Also, so the money we talked about from MARAD, it went around the world to save, in, to save maritime, uh, naval vessels. Um, there are three preserved World War II victory ships. Victory ships were built in California and they were built at such a phenomenal rate. This is where Rosie the Riveter became famous. Uh, Rosie the Riveter is, and the women like her were the women who built these victory ships. They could build a ship in a week. They were, fin it was fin fantastic uh, war effort. Uh, and so there are only three. One is in LA, it's the um, Lane Victory. The Jeremiah O'Brien is in San Francisco. And for any of you who saw the movie Titanic and you saw those big, huge pistons going and everything in the movie, that was actually the engine working on the Jeremiah O'Brien. The other one is the Red Oak and it's over in Richmond. It's also open for visitation. It's real fun to go on. If you haven't been on it, you should try it. Um, down in San Diego, we have the Midway, the aircraft carrier Midway, and that's at port. And that's also open to the public. And then finally, not to forget the little boat, but the um, PT boats and all the PT training, boat training for, um, for Vietnam happened in the Delta over in Rio Vista. And so these guys trained over in the Delta and then were sent off to Vietnam. And so there is a maritime museum over in Rio Vista for the PT boats. And so those are things that we have. This, tells you, um, this is the end of my talk, but it gives you an idea of all the different ways that we have repurposed boats in California over time from the 1840s on. Um, we have no idea if they repurposed uh, the balsa canoes um, prior to uh, historic immigration here to this, the, the state, but I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't. So anyway, this is a, I wanna thank you. Um, this was a pretty, this was lots of fun for me. Um, I finish off with this is a picture of the Snow Squall, the William Shand, the Margaret, and I can't even remember, the Vicar Abray. These are four ships that are in, in, in the harbor in Stanley. Um, the harbor master built a, a pier out over the cross of, a top of them and housed all of them in and it became um, the big warehouses for Stanley Harbor in the Falkland Islands. And I had the privilege of bringing back the bow of the snow squall to, um, to the United States. So thank you all. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to take them on. 
Shelly, I had no idea. That was fascinating. Thank you very, very much. Um, and um, and so we didn't. I didn't say this in the beginning, but I see we have many repeat guests. You know, you can put a question in the chat box, and I'll be happy to read that out loud and share that with Shelly. Um, in the meantime, um, Shelly, you know, um, any idea how many? Do we have an inventory of sunk ships? and maybe boats, I'm not sure how you categorize that for California. I mean, there's a tremendous number. Is there an actual inventory and is there speculation that there's a certain percentage above what's known that still that there's even more there? Well, I think you have to think that today by Lloyd's of London reporting over 10,000 ships are lost every year of over a hundred tons. That's a tremendous number of ships worldwide that are still being lost. Um, we have, we do not have a good, um, I wouldn't say, it. we do not have a handle on what is what is in California. We can, we can go back and we can look certainly through the records and see all the ships that never left port. Um, and we do have lots of, we have lots of written records about ships that were used as storehouses and ships that were done, but we really, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, we probably know a 10th of the number of vessels in California that are shipwrecks. Wow, that's mind boggling. Any in the Napa River that we know of? Well, we had one that uh, a ship a long time ago, it was, a, I think a World War I vessel. Um, it was one of the first times I ever understood what a shipwreck was. Um, that kind of got away from the captain somehow coming up the river from Mare Island and ran out into the islands there. And it stood proud out in the Delta Islands and the Napa River for years and years and years until they finally cut it down. So that was a kind of a fun one. We have some really fun vessels that would be great to see where they went and what happened to them. The dolphin, um, which was not only served, brought uh, supplies up here, but some people think that that was also put up to the side and used to uh, as a storehouse and possible uh, living quarters for people. So lots of things that were going on here. And we have a, we have a question from um, Monica Hunter. Are historic vessels in California waters protected by law? That's a really good question. Yes, yes they are. <laughs> Thanks, Monica. <laughs> so there's, there's in 1989, um, the U.S. signed into law the Abandoned Shipwreck Act. And that Abandoned Shipwreck Act is anything that's over 50 years old is protected um, by law. Uh, so you can't just go out and loot shipwrecks. They, um, they don't. Many shipwrecks, uh, some shipwrecks, um, so some of you um, for World War II, there were, uh, there were not in California so much, but there were uh, U-boats all over the Gulf of Mexico and along the Eastern seaboard, and some of those were sunk. Those are actually grave sites, and they're a little piece of Germany. Um, so, but off the coast here, we have the Montebello, which was sunk by a Japanese submarine um, in World War II. So there are different things going on, but yes, these ships are protected by law and um, you, need a, uh, you need permits to, to do research on them. Um, and and you, there are lots of places you can call and get help. There are a lot of groups that, could, that are willing to help um, people who are interested in specific shipwrecks. And I had no idea there was 29 underwater parks. Yeah, we have a wonderful system of underwater parks. For those of you who are lucky enough to hear Denise Japke talk in September, she talked about the dog holes. Dog holes are coves that are so small that you just can't just get into them. You gotta kind of squeeze yourself in. And so these ships would squeeze themselves into it and they would then shoot lumber down onto these ships or other kinds of things from the, from the local ranches. And, um, so lots of these dog holes are actually um, underwater or preserves. There's also, uh, most of the underwater preserves in California also have a species. So they're, they're related to biology and to fishes and to all kinds of things. Um, Point Arena Rock is one of them. Uh, there's Van Damme, interesting. We, we named the, um, 
we named the, uh, the, the ferry, but Von Damme State Park is one of them. Uh, there, there's uh, one at Casper um, in Mendocino. Um, there's the uh, Fort Ross is another one. Um, Julia Pelk, Julia, the Julia uh, Pfeiffer uh, is an underwater park down in Southern California, as is Refugio. There's just, they're all over, even out to Mono Lake. So fun stuff. Well, I, I'll tell you, I think that if the Petaluma Queen <laughs> or similar to Palabo would, would be, would come back to Napa or come to Napa, I do think it would be really fun. And I think it would be very popular. So, <laughs> I don't know, maybe a county supervisor can help us with that. <laughs> yeah. We could rename her, you know, the vine or something. <laughs> yeah. We want to do it now for something. But anyway, Shelly, thank you. This is really, really fun, really interesting. I love the pictures and my mind is just kind of, I had no idea. Honestly, this is fascinating. Thank you.